Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Minal Hajratwala. Hi Minal. Hi Joanna, thanks oh, for having me. No, it's great to have you on the show. So just as an introduction, Minal is the award-winning author of Leaving India, My Family's Journey from Five Villages to Five Continents, as well as a poet and editor of Out, Stories from the New Queer India. Minal is also a speaker, a coach and consultant, and today we're talking all about books in India, which is so exciting. I'm, I'm really excited about this topic. Great. Well, it sounds like you had an amazing trip to India recently. I did. I spent a couple of weeks cycling uh, on the West Coast um, from where you are, right, in Bangalore, uh, all the yes. way down to Kerala. So that was that was great. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and your writing background. Sure. So I um, have been a writer, I think, from a really young age. I used to write poems and stories. And uh, then I studied journalism and I became a journalist. And during that time, I um, also was working on my own creative work and I did poetry and I did a one woman show. And then I was uh, lucky enough to get a fellowship at Columbia University and I had a year off from journalism to sort of soak in everything that I wanted to soak in. And during that year, I ended up writing the proposal for my book, Leaving India. And so that kind of launched me into this parallel world of uh, writing books. And so now I'm working on a novel and I'm putting together my first poetry collection. And um, a couple of years ago, I edited an anthology. So it's been it's been a great adventure. And um, and then that has also read, led to my work as a writing coach, which has been a big focus for me over the past five years. And three years ago, I came to India on a fellowship, a Fulbright, to research my novel. And uh, while I was here, I just uh, fell in love with the place and the energy and ended up staying. Right. So you were born in America? Yes, I was born in San Francisco and uh, mostly have lived in the Bay Area. Right. And now you've, you've embraced the new India. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And and the book, Leaving India, was about my family's migrations out of India over the past hundred years. My great-grandfather left India in 1909, so it's been very interesting to sort of come back uh, three or four generations later. Yeah, that's it's so interesting. Uh, did any of them end up in England? Uh, yes, I have still several cousins in England and uh, a couple of branches of the family did end up in England. Some went directly to in England from London, uh, uh, sorry, some went directly to England from India and then others went via Kenya. So they spent some time in Kenya and then in the late 1960s when uh, most of the Indians were leaving East Africa, mm -hmm. they ended up in England as well. Wow, I've watched a documentary on the railways, wasn't it? That's what, what uh, Indians were working on, the railways in, in Africa. So yes, many interesting. of yeah. Yeah. So um, obviously, I've I've been to India a couple of times. I've uh, I worked in the IT industry, which nowadays is dominated by by Indians. <laughs> and um, and in England, you know, we have a lot of, of Indian and Pakistani people. So I'm kind of it's kind of part of my culture. You know, um, I, I feel partially Indian, and I feel at home in India. And I would love to live there myself. It's actually one of my kind of things. Uh, Varanasi is one of those places I want to go back to again. And but a lot of my listeners don't know much about India except for maybe old stereotypes, you know, of, of poverty or whatever. So maybe you could just start by giving us, like, what is India like now? Yes, well, it's everything. I mean, I don't know if you can hear the dogs yeah. barking in the background. <laughs> so, you know, it's everything. It's, it's packs of wild dogs and it's... Um, a lot of the stereotypes that people probably have about India are still true. And then alongside that, over the past 15 years or so, there's been this tremendous economic growth that has created a huge middle class, um, which is consists you know, of several hundred million people who are literate in English, which has a big impact for the book market, which we'll talk about later, I'm sure. And um, just the economy in general has really experienced a boom. Um, we're kind of in the 
slight slowing down of that boom. <laughs> um, and I was a journalist in Silicon Valley for about eight years. So there's a lot about living here in Bangalore that reminds me of that time. Um, you know, I drive around Bangalore and I see Google and IBM and uh, Intel and pretty much every tech company has some of their operations here. And in the beginning, it was really outsourcing, so call centers and coding. Um, but now it's a, a real wide range of functions. And that means that um, Bangalore in particular has a very cosmopolitan class of people living here who are coming from all over India, first of all, for the jobs. So it's a very young city, a lot of young energy. And then also from all over the world. So there's a really huge expat community here as well as a lot of what are in India called NRIs, non-resident Indians, which are people like me who mostly uh, have been out of India for a long time or maybe even their entire lives and now are settling back in India. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it just, it, so much of about, about it right now is growing and when the economy grows, then naturally there's more space for arts and culture to grow and for new ideas to get off the ground. So the anthology that I edited was an example of that where I just happened to meet someone who was retailing books and wanted to get into publishing and we came up with an idea for their first title and we ran with it and it was a year and a half from concept to product, which is really fast for a literary print anthology. Mm. Um, so, and my next venture, which is publishing poetry books in a collective, is even faster. It's just been about six months since we really started meeting and talking and putting together manuscripts. And our, we just were at the printers today looking at the paper and <laughs> feeling it. So the costs are much lower, which means there's a lower barrier to entry in the market for most things. And the energy for new ideas is really high right now. There's a, a very entrepreneurial spirit and a sense that anything is possible. Mm. I totally felt that. I mean, I really, I, as mm. I said, I do feel at home in India, even though there is still the poverty on one side, there's also, like you said, this growing middle class, which means everything comes up. Um, and actually, mm. I, th I believe Kerala is one of the the, uh, well, the the most literate states in the world yeah. or something. It's got you know yes. one of the highest literacy rates. Yeah, something like 96, 97% in Kerala. Yeah, way higher than America. <laughs> <laughs> which is fascinating and um, yeah and I guess uh, and I also when I was working in IT uh, what I noticed was a real shift um, with women and where women you know were used to just do I guess you know had to leave when they had children and stuff women are now doing amazing things within these industries aren't they and engineering and IT and things have really changed for women yeah, exactly. And, you know, many companies are finding themselves with equal or even greater numbers of women in the workforce. So one of the things that I've been doing here is some uh, diversity consulting because I used to do that in the U.S. And the it's amazing because in the U.S. it's all about racial diversity and, you know, prejudice and how to overcome stereotypes in the workplace. In India, a large part of the diversity training is really about uh, gender, and this is the first time that you've had large numbers of women in the workforce, and at the same time, you have a, a fairly segregated um, kind of uh, educational system and social structure. So, um, you know, a lot of times people are coming into the workforce, and that's the first time that they're really fully having a conversation with someone of the opposite gender who's not a family member. And so a lot of it is really just about how to get girls and boys to work together. <laughs> Which is, is brilliant and that's the thing is there are these contradictions and that's I think that's what makes it a vibrant society as well. There's so much going on. Um, but yeah. let's narrow it down a bit to the English speaking audience because maybe you could just explain about the languages in India because from what I understand it's, there's not just one language. <laughs> Right, of course not. I mean, India has about 35 official languages. It might have gone up uh, since last I checked. And um, so each state has its own language. And most people are 
uh, verbally fluent in at least three, as many as seven languages. Um, English is just one of those. English has become uh, the language of the educated class, the middle and upper classes. And, you know, the number that I've heard is 300 million English literate people. So that's as large as, you know, almost the entire U.S. Uh, market <laughs> for books. And that educated class is growing, and uh, because of the economic liberalization of the 90s, they have more disposable income. And books are really kind of a status item. They're an item that people want to have. Um, and so it's really great. It's really different than being in the U.S. where there's sort of this you know, doom and gloom <laughs> over the publishing industry. Um, here, if you are having a book launch, you feel like a movie star. The media is there, they've got cameras, multiple television cameras, coverage in newspapers, magazines, you know, so it's it's kind of amazing. It's And often there's a movie star who's there to help launch the event and kind of ceremonially unwrap the book out of its shiny uh, oh. wrapping. So it's quite a fabulous thing. And, um, and at the same time, because... Uh, computer penetration is not as high mm. as it is in other places. So the print industry is doing quite well. And ebooks, as I understand it, are also taking off, although um, there's obviously a big problem with piracy in India and the, the ability of people to just, you know, get ebooks is much higher than I think their willingness to pay for ebooks. Mm. It's a different kind of approach to intellectual property than mm. in the West. Well, no, that's, that's really interesting. So just coming back on the print books. So mm -hmm. at the moment, that's what I felt as well. Like the internet bandwidth isn't big enough for, you know, yeah. and people don't really have smartphones. They have cell phones. Everyone has a cell phone, but not necessarily a smartphone. So yeah. so print books are still dominant in, in the market. So how... Um, I, I guess uh, I've got a whole load of questions on books. Let's, let's start with. I'll just I'll read from my list. I'm getting too excited. Yeah. Um, so, what types of books do Indians read? Like, what are the what are the books that are in the bookstores that people read? I mean, you're doing poetry, which, as we all know, is a really niche market and hard to sell <laughs> anywhere. <Yeah. laughs> but you know, it's for love and education and craft. But but what are the books that are like bestsellers in India? You know, there's a whole range from really well-crafted literature books that are serious contenders on the world stage. Like um, there's a book called Narcopolis by a writer named Jeet Thayil that uh, was up for the Booker Prize this year. And, you know, so obviously there's the high literature. Uh, and then there's complete pulp and self-help and everything uh, like that. And I think the big change that I see is that in the past, those, all of the niches were pretty much dominated by British and American authors. You know, you had Mills and Boone and Enid Blyton and all of those things here. And now you still have those, but you also have Indian authors in all of the niches. So you have Indian authors doing romance and sci-fi and children's books and kind of catching up, really, you know, and there's there's really quite a hunger in the local publishing industry for um, native grown authors. So, for example, when I, when Leaving India came out in 2009, my India publisher, um, so it was published first by Houghton Mifflin in the U.S., and then in India, uh, it was published by a press called Westland, which that year, 2009, had 15 books on its list. And they were expanding. So the next year they were planning to double, and the year after that to double again. Mm -hmm. So now they have 60 books that they're putting out a year in such a short span of time, and which means that they're really looking for authors, and they're looking for um, writers who can bridge the gap between the Indian reader's taste, which is actually quite broad and sophisticated and complex, and the desire for local um, local advice. So, like, for example, I just got a uh, an email from, I think, Penguin India saying that they just issued the first Indian fitness book for people who go to the office. <laughs> you know, so, so these very interesting sort of niches um, and... And a lot of the uh, 
the markets such as cookbooks. My mom published a cookbook here mm -hmm. um, because there's just really a, a need for content. It's right. a good time to be a, a writer. And I think that if you're a writer who has a story that is relevant to India and your English is decent, it's an easy time to get published here. Right, okay, so uh, I'm obviously in England. I want my books to be in India. Um, and, yeah. you know, people listening, you know, I have my opening scene is in Varanasi in my first book. <laughs> and I'm going to write I'm going to write another one. It's going to have Kali in and it's going to have lots more Indian myth and stuff, but with the aim of getting more into India. So how can non-Indian based authors um, get their books into India? Because Amazon's Kindle's opened up, Create Space has opened up, but yes. the prices are too high from what I can see and yeah. I don't know how much the Kindle has penetrated so how how would someone like me get my books into India yeah that's a good question as a self-publishing mm. person I mean of course there's Flipkart which is uh, kind of until now has been India's equivalent of Amazon and um, and then there are the traditional publishers some of whom are doing ebooks some aren't um, but I think in India the big Thing is really to just come and do events and invite the media because the media here are not as fussy and not as entrenched around traditional publishing versus self-publishing. There's really, it's, it's interesting because there's not such a hard line as there's been in the U.S. I think partly because the U.S., um, and I can't speak to the U.K., but in the U.S., I think the publishing industry was already so mature by the time ebook technology and print on demand came around that there was, you know, a very strong sense of how things should be. And in India, all of that is new. You know, there are just a handful of reputable literary agents in India, for example. Most writers still work directly with their publishers. They don't go through agents. So there's not that extra level of gatekeeping. Um, and similarly, there aren't all the barriers between um, the author and the reader. The reader's not really too worried about uh, print quality, even English quality, to be frank. <laughs> A lot of this stuff that comes out is really questionable. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but it's the story. I think in India, it's the story that sells. And, um, and just as the publishing industry for books is expanding, the English language media has also been expanding. So there is a huge news hole for them to fill every day, and they are really looking for stories. Mm. Wow, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of like, well, part of me thinks it would be just easier to try and sell rights to a publisher in India than go about it. Might. Yeah. But you, yeah. you're doing this poetry thing um, as self-published or you've got a, you actually have a publishing company now? We are setting up a publishing company. We're meeting with our lawyer tomorrow. <laughs> we're putting all the nuts and bolts in place. And what we're looking at is a collective model. So uh, sort of similar to Alice James Books, which is a 40-year-old independent press in the U.S. that works on a collective. So each uh, poet who comes in becomes a co-owner of the press and then helps to make decisions about future titles and it's a mentorship model. So uh, let's say that I come into the collective, then I would spend a year working on my book, getting it you know, done, getting the manuscript ready, getting it to the printer, talking about the cover, working on everything, and really learning the whole process beginning to end. And then the second year that I'm in the collective, I would mentor another writer who comes in mm -hmm. and there's a competitive process to have manuscripts selected. Mm -hmm. So we're starting right now with the manuscripts of the three founders and we're kind of our own guinea pigs so for the first year or so we'll figure out what we know about paper in India and what we can learn about printing and whether to go with offset or digital offset or digital um, and sort of think about all these things and how to set up distribution. The And then after that we'll, we'll pull in other people's manuscripts. The big big challenge in India, whether it's a traditional publisher or a self-publisher or whatever, is distribution because it's such a vast country and um, it doesn't have, uh, you know, there's a lot of 
uh, red tape around you can't, for example, just simply take a credit card transaction from somebody. You have to be registered. There's there's not an easy gateway like PayPal. Mm. Um, there are some equivalents, but you still have to be registered with the government as an entity, and things are set up so that you um, you know everything goes to the tax division and everything like that. So. Uh, distribution is difficult and also because it's huge it's just expensive to get books everywhere um, the bookstores are um, really arranged a lot of people still buy books in these little small stalls that are on the street that have you know basically like a guy at a counter yeah. and then some books on display almost like a newsstand and then a whole bunch of books in the back stored that you don't even know what they are but you ask him what do you have that's this this or this and then he'll bring out titles so that's one whole sort of you know they call it the unorganized sector mm -hmm. and then there are these larger chain bookstores um, that are just emerging in the last uh, five or ten years and they they bear a little more resemblance to what a Western person might think of as a bookstore, uh, but they definitely have their own challenges in terms of just, you know, their inventory and computerization of things and all of that. Yeah, it really is. It's a bit Wild West at the moment, I think, would be, <laughs> would be the comment. So, so we talked a bit, a bit there about distribution. What about marketing? So apart from going to the guy and asking for a book or going to a bookstore, are there book bloggers? Are there sites that people find? You know, How do people find books or, or discover books? Yeah, a lot of it, India has, I think, the world's highest rate of usage of Facebook right now. Um, so a lot of it is really good old social media um, and anything that plugs into Facebook, like Goodreads, can work for that. There's also, there's a network of bloggers called Blog Adda, uh, B-L-O-G-A-D-D-A, and they basically have a book reviewing program so you can offer a certain number of books and then reviewers pick it up and uh, and review and you know and it's like anything it's a range of bloggers who have like three readers and bloggers who have several hundred readers um, Twitter's Twitter I think is growing in India and the traditional bookstores are definitely there and the mainstream media again is you know a big source um, and a lot of it really is just word of mouth, I think. People who know people, somebody gets excited and then they pass it on and then somehow it blows up and becomes a topic of, uh, you know, a television show or something like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things are, um, what I see in terms of book coverage is there are some reviews, but again, the infrastructure for critical reviewing is not that developed. Um, I see more excerpts published as, you know, fiction in literary journals and magazines um, or even nonfiction, so articles, and, um, and interviews. People seem to have a real appetite for interviews with authors, and uh, there's, a, there's a site called Author TV uh, that does actually quite good 20, 30-minute substantive interviews with authors, and uh, they have a pretty good following, too. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Now, wh um, what about pricing? Um, so people have to change that if people are on KDP, they're going to have to change their rupee price. Um, yeah. what, what type of price do people pay for an ebook, and what would they pay for a print book in India? That's a good question. The print price is really, it's a range anywhere from, I'd say, 150 rupees for, or even 100 rupees for something sort of very cheap, paperback, um, kind of, you know, chiclet or uh, a lot of genre, uh, thin paperback fiction, that kind of stuff, to probably a really serious, hefty nonfiction book might be something like 800 rupees. I'd say 800 is probably the upper limit. So that's, you know, about $15 US. Um, and for ebooks, I think it's really a whole range. I don't think people have at all figured out what to do with the ebook market. So some are just free, some are, you know, a few rupees, some are, uh, I, I think they're, they're not as high, obviously, as print books. But I just think people are really all over the place. And a lot of people are um, kind of confused what to do about ebooks. <laughs> 
yeah i can see that well i i would advise everybody to at least go into their back end and change the default because if, if it defaults from the u.s price it's way too expensive so yes. i think i changed mine to about 250 rupees for the um for the ebook but the problem with the create space indian uh, amazon india create space print on demand it's way too high because it ships from america okay. so i was oh. wondering do you know about um because i've had a look at povi and cinnamon mm -hmm. teal are they well-known print on demand printers or are there any other print on demand that you recommend in india Oh, that's a good question. I have not heard anything about print-on-demand in India, and I think it's partly because printing is pretty cheap. Um, so, you know, for example, right now we're looking at offset for a book of about a hundred and, oh, I think it's about a hundred and twenty pages, five hundred copies, and the price we're being quoted, this is paperback, is uh, 40,000 rupees. So 80 rupees a book for printing. So 40,000 rupees, that's, you know, under, what is that? Can I do math in my head? <laughs> um, it's, it's around, you know, six to $800. Mm. So that's really affordable. So I don't, I think print on demand is going to be a tough sell, um, right. in India really, because to make it worth it, Mm, they they're going to have to be pretty low in terms of the quality as well as the price. Um, so you know what we're getting quoted for offset is around eighty rupees a book, and that's um, I I don't know of any print on demand folks in the U.S. that print at you know under two dollars a book. Exactly, and that's what I've seen as a big problem. Um, yeah. No, that's great. And then what about self-publishing? Uh, has self-publishing in the Amazon KDP, is that becoming more well-known in India? I think that people have been self-publishing in India for a long time. I don't think that there really is a big pull to do it through Amazon mm -hmm. um, because, again, because just doing it through straight to a printer locally is pretty cheap. It's pretty affordable. In poetry, most books are either self-published or published with some author contribution. So unless they're, you know, really uh, being published by a big press like Penguin or Oxford, most authors uh, are contributing something to their poetry manuscript, for example. Um, our model is hoping not to do that um, because we're going to do other ways of raising money. But um, in fiction and nonfiction, there's been less self-publishing because the market is so hungry for manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes people do end up publishing, self-publishing, um, you know, their memoirs or other things that are going to be small of, of sort of more limited scope and interest. Mm. And I think yeah. it's interesting you say that because uh, coming, you know, Britain is this very snobby literary community, and I, I you know, when I'm in India, I, I, it's a very entrepreneurial nation because people have to be. There's no like benefit system, so you actually yeah. have you have to work every day to make your food. So you're, I'm always impressed, you know, with everyone everyone doing their stuff as they do, and I think that yeah. probably spills into, like you say, self publishing. Whatever, it's just another way of getting a book out there it's not yeah. a big deal like in, in England it's a big deal and similarly there's not such a big deal about copyrights for example I just saw this book um, that's quite a well-known book by a Tibetan poet that was published about 20 years ago at the beginning or somewhere in the sort of heyday of the free Tibet movement in India and um, it was published with an open copyright before, you know, there was that terminology and published in one press and then reprinted in another press, reprinted in another press, reprinted by another press. And just whoever wanted to print it, printed it. And you sort of paid however much you could pay for it. And all the proceeds went to the movement. And that book ended up having 10,000 copies sold. So, you know, for a small poetry book, um, it's quite remarkable. And I think that that it's that's the kind of success story that's possible here so it's not like anybody's getting rich off of books in India I don't think that that can happen the only way that that happens is basically if your book is good enough or does well enough in India that 
Europe or America pick it up and then you sell the foreign rights and then that's when people make substantial money. <laughs> but Indian authors are still, you know, pretty much doing it for the love of it and a little bit of cash comes in and that's a bonus. Mm. Well, it's funny because I picked up a book at the bookstore um, by a guy called Ashwin Sanghi, the, the Rosabelle uh, line. Yeah, you've heard of him. And, and he's a, a highly paid speaker in Britain as well. And, you know, I yeah. see his books everywhere. And he, he was self-published and then got picked up. And um, so, like you say, the, these things happen, but the other way around. <laughs> yeah. And well, and the other thing that happens to people like that, whose books become very popular in India, is that then they then pirate copies become available. So then there are mass market copies. So that book has sold many, many thousands of copies. But a lot of those copies have been basically run off of somebody else's press and they're sold on the street corner by these boys who go around and have these stacks of books and they'll have everything in there. They'll have, you know, the most popular Indian authors, they'll have some Danielle Steele, they'll have some Jeffrey Archer, and it's just all kind of printed on this very shoddy paper, clearly not the publisher, but, you know, people are happy to buy them and read them and throw them away. Right, so now I'm less excited. My th <laughs> my 300 million English speaking people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see um, as the as you say, there's a status symbol amongst the wealthier middle class Indians around books. There may well be a status symbol around smartphones, around ebook reading. In the same way, it might come from America and, and the UK. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think the smartphone um, and device penetration is changing every month, every six months. I think different things are happening. And uh, as the lower, as the cost drops on those, and uh, the screen size also is growing, and those tend to be really popular here. So mm -hmm. the, the kind of larger, cheaper devices are doing pretty well here. And a lot of them have um, some kind of e-reader capacity. Even even the little you know phones that are uh, the dumb phones are are starting to have these these little apps that are workarounds. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm, yeah, I think that's that's going to be the next thing. Now, uh, just one more question. Um, do Bangalore has a book fair. Is that right? Yes, it does. Bangalore has a literary festival uh, mm. that happens. That just happened actually. When was it? September or October? Mm. Yes. Mm, and not because and isn't that that's the biggest one in India? That's the most important one, isn't it? The biggest one in India is in Jaipur. So that one is huge, and sixty thousand people go to that every year, and um, very famous people go to that. Like mm. Oprah went to that last year, and uh, Tina Brown's been there, and Salman Rushdie was supposed to go there and then didn't go there. <laughs> so there's always something happening in the Jaipur Literary Festival, and the Jaipur Festival's been going on for a while, and in its wake, other cities have started literary festivals. So the Bangalore Literary Festival is about three years old, and um, almost every big city in India now has a literary festival. Hmm. So we've got a list of those, which I'm happy to share with you know you and anyone who wants it. Uh, they can just email me or whatever. We should probably just put it up. It's kind of hard to find where they are uh, city by city and site by site, but hmm. we've got a good list. I'll put it, we'll put it in the show notes. That's probably the best thing. Um, okay. Yeah, fantastic. So that's given us a really good idea of what's going on. So I just also wanted to ask you, you coach authors in writing and you do courses. Just tell us a bit more about what you can, what you do to help authors and if you have anything going on right now. Sure. <laughs> um, so I teach uh, a few different classes online. So one of them is called Writing from the Chakras, and it's a real body-based system. So it's great for generating lots of new work and breaking through blocks and getting really deep with your characters and your stories. And um, sometimes people take it because they've had some trauma and they need to write about that. And other people take it because they just you know, need some inspiration to get juiced. So, um, so that goes through the seven chakras of the body and different 
uh, kinds of energy that come out of that and just blows open the kinds of writing that, that we can do. Um, and then the other class that I've been teaching is called Blueprint Your Book, which is all about structure. So it's really for people who've got a book and they need to find that structure, uh, which is all important. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, and in February, I will start a new class called the Revision Master Class, which is for people who've got 50 pages of a manuscript and are ready to start workshopping it and diving into revising and learning a lot of different kinds of revision strategies mm. to get through. And then I also work one-on-one -on -one with people working on blocks or coaching or mentoring um, and just guiding through the whole process from generating ideas all the way through that final line edit before you publish. Fantastic. So where can people find you and your books and your programs online? Yes, they can find me at www.minalhadratwala.com and my name is M-I-N-A-L. H A J R A T W A L A. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> it is actually spelt how you say it, so that's quite good. <laughs> and on Twitter, I'm Minal H, which is a little bit easier. M I N A L H. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Minal. That was great. Thank you, Joanna.